here's what the word of the Lord says. It reads as this. It says, what then are we to sin because we are not under the law, but under grace by no means? Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, that you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed and having been set free from sin have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations for just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness leading to more lawlessness. So now present your members as slaves to righteousness leading to sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you to get, uh, were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Praise be to God for the reading of his word. You all can go ahead and have a seat. I remember getting one of my first main jobs. I worked at a fast food restaurant and um, it, was a, it was a great experience in many ways. I learned much about um, life and um, how to manage um, a job and how to, to make money. But one thing that I quickly realized is that um, the love of, of mammon and money can quickly consume you. Uh, the idea of getting your first paycheck um, can be something that you think about and you're like, man, I'm excited. I know what I'm going to do. Um, to this extent, I actually got my first paycheck from this fast food restaurant and I had spent all of it by the day that I had it. Um, it, it showed the love or the desire for it um, that what I was seeking to, to gain. But it was a challenge for me as well, too, of what I would maybe be tempted to give my life to become a servant of something. And it's so easy in life to, to not realize how we can become so attached to something that we begin to serve it. We begin to do whatever we can to, to maintenance the relationship so that we can gain what we want out of it. Uh, many of you might be fighting that battle same today as maybe you think about money in your own life and, and what it can drive you towards and what it can bring to you. Um, but as I think about that from an early um, season of life, it was something that gripped me. And I didn't know it could happen that quick. I didn't know that I could become so quickly enthralled with the idea of gaining this money and what it could mean to life. And so this morning, I want to challenge us as we think about what we are a servant to and what we give ourselves toward, that we would make sure that we're actually giving ourselves not to that which is the gratification of the desires of the flesh, but that we are giving ourselves to that which is righteous, that which is found in Christ. Because here's the reality. Your heart is being gravitated towards something and will begin to give itself to something. That you will become a servant in your life of that which brings glory to God or that which brings dishonor to God. And this morning I want to tag the text for our exchange. Servants of righteousness. Servants of righteousness. It's interesting here because as the writer continues this narrative, he uses a similar phrase that he uses early on in chapter 6. He brings it back up 15 verses later. And you might wonder, why would he even need to bring up these, these similar ideas? He says, what then? Are we to sin because we're not under the law but under grace? He raises the same question in verse 1. What shall we say then? Are we continuing in sin and that grace may abound? He's using this similar type of conversation point to make sure that we understand the power of the, re the renovation, the renewal that the gospel of Jesus Christ brings. This is a reminder for us in this text as we look at verses 15 through 18 that service unto God actually emerges from the heart. That if you want to become a servant of righteousness and not a slave to sin or a servant to sin, then you need to understand what's happening within your heart. Because here in this passage, as it's laying out this foundation, it's telling us that grace renovates our heart and it also offers us a path in obedience. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound is the first statement. Verse 15, what then? Are we to sin because we are not under the law but under grace by no means? Because he raises the next question. 
Do you not know that if you present your members to anyone as obedient slaves, you are a slave of the one whom you obey? Well, how do you change in that pathway of obedience? You change by grace, changing your heart and renovating it, allowing you to see that there's actually another path, a different path. Many times in life, it's so easy for us to be so consumed by that which brings us a little bit of enticement and excitement in life that we begin to go down paths and it's hard to be able to turn, to change. What this is assuming within the Christian faith is that it is this good news of Jesus that actually grips us in a way that moves us down a different allegiance, down a different path that brings glory and honor to God. And as we see this in our own lives, we need to be be aware of this need of complete renovation and transformation. This is why the author wants us to understand that in verses 16 that humanity becomes either obedient to sin or righteousness. And for some of us right now, you might feel that sense of war within you, that that challenge within your own mind of, okay, am I going to submit or feed this temptation to, to live for unrighteousness or am I going to feed the desire to glorify God and to live for him? And what this text is assuming for us all is that you cannot do both. That if you're presenting yourself as obedient to Christ, then you're going to be challenged when you have to give up other things that lead to death. That he's saying that there's one of these leads to life, but the other leads to death. And so which road are you going to choose? Are you going to keep feeding that which is strangling you? Are you going to to deal with it. One way to think about this this morning is, is from this idea, is that this double-mindedness that's going to be within us, that's tempting you, um, is going to challenge you to have to make a decision. The double-mindedness is what I'm meaning here, is that you might have been giving yourself to um, Jesus in certain ways that you want to, but on the other side of it, you're, you're trying to feed the passions that you feel like is, is enticing you differently. I'm raising this idea to say, you, you need to think through, even in the war within the mind, in the battlefield of your head, and what's going on there about what is going to determine whether or not um, that which is victorious in your life. How are you going to begin to understand that for yourself? Because if we do not wholeheartedly begin to, to deal with that is, what, what is happening within us, that which you don't want to win will be the victor, will win in the end. This is important because this is why some maybe hear general proclamations of the gospel and um, even culturally they want to affirm the Christian faith and the tradition in different ways, but you still see that tension within them to choose the path of following after Jesus. This is a challenge here of the battle of the minds that you make a decision along the way that you're going to give all of yourself to Christ. You're going to deny the sin that is, is waging within you, that you're choosing to follow after Jesus. That this has ransomed you in such a way that all of yourself before Christ was given towards that which leads to death, but it was only the work of Jesus that changed your heart, that renovated you. This is why in verse 17 is, but thanks be to God that you who are once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed and haven't been set free from sin and have become slaves of righteousness. It's within this grace that's changing us that our hearts are renovated and that leads to a joyful submission to Jesus, his teachings, and his standard. A joyful submission to him in this. It's a, a praise of gratitude in verse 17 that is the beginning part of that verse because you knew what you were enslaved to and he has changed you and has brought you into a new kingdom and you have a new commitment and allegiance to Christ. That is praise be to Jesus that you're not going after those same gratifications of the heart no longer. And I pray that you see that even in your own life, that your, your life is not so blurry, that you're not struggling with a sense of double consciousness in such a way that you, you struggle to have a single-mindedness, that you struggle with seeing that there is a path that Jesus is desiring for you. Because until you see it from a, a single-mindedness of, of a desire to want to glorify God, 
you'll struggle with submission to Jesus. You truly will. There will be areas in your life that you'll say, Jesus, I don't know if this is worth it. I, Jesus, I want heaven. I want eternal life, but this addiction that I've been feeding, it, it's so good, though. Can't I have that plus you? Can, can't I just keep going after whatever is going to fill me, knowing that I'm secure in you, knowing that I've been freed from the law, that I can live and, and treat grace however I want to. And this is why he says, by no means. You have to choose a path. You have to choose the way that you're going to go. This is why the submission to Jesus in this area is a mark of gratitude in the Christian life. It's not begrudgingly that you're having to choose Jesus over the temptations of your flesh. It's not that it's, man, it, it, Jesus, I, man, it's hard. I'm, I'm giving up my, my friendships that are driving me to a life of death for you. Oh, man, I, I'm sorry I have to do this. It's Jesus that I want to live the life that you're calling me to. And I, because you've changed me, because you've done this work, you first love me. I am joyfully desiring to walk with you despite of what rubbish it might cause in my life, what chaos it might, might cause in my life of I'm living in a way that's different than those around me. It should lead you to have a, a life of gratitude. It doesn't say it's going to be an easy path to the path of gratitude. But the path of mortification of sin is not light. Mortification means to kill, to slay sin. And that path of you giving yourself to something that is righteous is a hard path, but it's a path that will lead to much joy, yes, in eternity, but joy now because you're finding a hope in Christ that is different than this world could ever bring. That happens by you first submitting to him, but also by you seeing that his teachings and his standards are good. That when you see what Jesus is saying that he's calling us to in this life through his gospels, but also through all of his word, that you find that as valuable. Not just valuable, but invaluable. You see it as a, a bedrock and a foundation for the Christian life. It is not just a recommendation, God, to the best way to join your, uh, enjoy your experience. This is not the way that you, you might go on a vacation, you see all the places you need to visit, and you see all the ways that you can enjoy this location, and it's just a recommendation of the way that you can spend your trip. But this is much more than that. It's, it's Jesus himself saying, if you want to find the most in life, it's in the path of self-denial. It's in the path of you giving yourself to following after me. Do you want this path? See, many of us take the Bible and even the teachings of Jesus as something that's just a good recommendation. Good principles to consider for this world and that it might just help you have a better life, but it's much more life-giving than that. It can give you much more stability than maybe what you believe it can offer. You were once slave of sins, but you have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teachings to which you were committed. That the gospel is that which you have submitted yourself to that is changing you and that you're committing yourself to living the way of Jesus and having been set free from sin. I've become slaves of righteousness. When you understand that Jesus actually sets a standard for your life and pushes you on a path, you understand that this is the only pathway to righteousness. It's, it's not that there's multiple ways and multiple other habits that can get you there, but following him is what's going to lead you to being a servant of righteousness. Friends, I, I don't know what area of your life that is invading today or right now in these moments, that you have not allowed yourself to be a servant of righteousness, that Jesus is calling you to go down a path, maybe to change habits, to change rhythms, but that battle that you're struggling with is whether or not you will become a servant of righteousness in this area of your life. I want to encourage you this morning that the beginning of you taking that step is going to come from your heart being changed. Through your heart desiring for Jesus to do something greater than what you can imagine. 
This leads me to the second observation this morning. Sanctification feels unnatural without Jesus. Sanctification feels unnatural without Jesus. Look at verse 19 with me, if you would. I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented yourself as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. First, we need to see in this text that Paul is saying he needs to put this in human terms to explain it to us. Here, Paul is using language that is common to their culture and to their vernacular to help them to understand their allegiance to sin, but also the allegiance that he is desiring for them to have to Christ. That he uses this language to communicate of a deep bondage to sin. This is why he's using this slave to sin. You are given over to it. You are bound to it. In that same direction, he's, he's trying to help them understand that whether you realize it or not, you are consciously or unconsciously tethered to sin. You are entangled with it. You are so uh, caught up with it that you don't even realize it at times. And he's using this language to try to grip their mind. He wants them to know you don't know how bad off you are without the grace of God. But thanks be to God that you can be removed from this and that if you are in Christ, you have been removed from the, the yoke, the bondage that sin brings. So for Christians, there's much hope even in this text because you are the people who have been redeemed from that which is holding you hostage. For the believer, the sin does not hold you hostage in the same way. You're not just walking down the path aimlessly, but you have a light shining on your path, helping you to see that which you are doing and how you can maneuver even when sin is creeping and approaching your door. He puts us in human terms because he wants everyone to understand that if this isn't properly addressed, it will lead to chaos in your life. Years and years of you striving after whatever, again, to satisfy your flesh. Generations and decades of ruins and decay based on your actions and your living. Maybe that's not your story, but maybe you've felt the impact of other people's lives and their stories of how they've made messes of their life and how it impacts culture and spaces and people, those whom you're trying to care for. It's a challenge there. But it's also Paul highlighting our agency and even our want for independence. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity, and the lawlessness leading to more lawlessness. So now present your members as slaves to righteousness leading to sanctification. You have the ability to control your members of how you use your body. Remember, we talked about this language of members. This is all of you, mentally, physically, emotionally, your actions, your thoughts, what you say, everything, that you must steward that which God has given you. And this is where sanctification is pushing against the concept of your own individualism. Yes, you do have a sense of responsibility over your body, but as you have this responsibility to steward your life, you are supposed to be following after Jesus and submitting yourself to him. So this is where the tension comes at. It's not that you just determine that which is righteous or unrighteous in your life, but there is a standard and a teaching which you're building your life on that is determining that. And when that standard of teaching is determining your life, you understand that you are dying to yourself in this process and you're actually following after Jesus and that pushes back on mere individualism. That you can navigate the Christian life by yourself. This idea of sanctification is, is calling you to um, a, a higher standard of becoming like Jesus, but you don't know the standard without him. You can't even begin to grow if it's not for the gospel changing your heart and helping you to conform to that which he desires for you. It challenges those who are individually minded. Those who, what I mean by that individually minded in this sense is that you're going after that enslavement to sin and that you are pursuing that which doesn't 
bring honor to God. It's a challenge here that we all need to understand this communal vision of restoration in our lives. That in the garden, the triune God desired a relationship with us. And even though sin came in and broke um, and distorted that relationship, that the triune God is desiring to bring about restoration in your life. And that in that process, it is going to feel unnatural for you to realize you need to be restored. No one likes someone to come into their house and to think that their house is a mess and to think you need to change everything about this house. If someone came to your life and told you that, you'd be deeply offended. I hope so. I hope you're somewhat offended. Some of you just know, like, it's pretty bad. We need to do something about it. I get that to some degree. But it probably took you some time to get there, right? It took some time of you becoming stale and realizing that, oh, this is just going downhill. But realistically, if even if you just recently came to know Jesus or you've been following him for a while, if I were to sit down and have a conversation with you and say, yeah, there's, there's probably some big areas in your life that probably need a change and here's some things that I've observed or something like that, you would say, well, how do you know? Why are you picking on me in this area of my life? But many times we don't see that type of challenge, even from Jesus himself, that he has more for us in every element of our lives. Even in the areas that you feel very comfortable in, you are crushing it right now, still needs more renovation. Even if you're at the top of your game in something right now, whether that's in, in the workplace, whether that's in, in the home, whether that's in your neighborhood, we're still becoming something in light of who Jesus is. And that's still a process that we're choosing whether or not we're going to keep giving of our leadership abilities, of our servant nature, of our relationships with other people? Are we going to keep seeking to submit those as instruments for righteousness? Or are we going to allow that which God has gifted us to become enslaved to that which he doesn't desire it to be? Again, this is a challenge for us all to not become content with past growth. Some of us have fallen into that in our lives that you focus on certain areas of yourself for a season and you've grown immensely. Praise be to God. I'm grateful that you've grown. But you now lay that struggle or, or lay that need to grow in that past season. I really worked on this five years ago and I really felt like I, you know, I, I'm able to deal with it now. I got it. I got over it. But we don't think about it as, well, I might not be as bad as I used to be in this area, but I might still be needing to grow in what it looks like to honor Jesus in this area. You might say, hey, I used to say so many bad things about everybody else. I used to be, you know, the worst of the worst when it came to my mouth slandering people. I don't do it as much anymore. Again, I use that as, a, as, a, as an example because we sometimes think of our growth in light of who we are, not in light of who Jesus is. Yes, you might be a better you from yesterday or yesteryear, whatever that was, but Jesus is the standard for your growth in your life. And we never arrive at Jesus until the consummation of his redemption, that he brings about the fullness of the weight of that restoration in your life. Sanctification happens by God growing you in righteousness. Him doing a work. And, and friends, it, it takes your willingness to say, help me to see the areas of my life that are unrighteous. It's a vulnerable question. Maybe if you're too up in the clouds and you don't see anything in your life, be bold enough to ask somebody else to encourage you in this way. And I said encourage you, particularly. What are some ways that you, could, you think I could grow in this season? Don't be afraid to ask that question. Because you're afraid of the answer. Because if you hear the answer, that means that you can't deny that there's a problem. Friends, I want to challenge you this morning so that you could experience all that Jesus has because it will definitely feel unnatural for you to grow in your faith and sanctification without Jesus. It will feel like the worst thing happening to you in your life. It will feel like God, why do I even have to go through this process? Can't I just wait for the day that you come back and you return and you bring about the fullness of your redemption? 
to focus on growing? Here's three ideas that are foundational for your view of sanctification. Three, three statements I want you to, to, to remember. First is that desire is foundational for growth. For some of us today, the starting point for you to begin being a servant of righteousness is that you need to care. Some of you right now hear me talking about this, and you legitimately probably don't care that much. And that's okay. You got to acknowledge where you're at. If you're not real, you can't grow. But even for others, you've settled with your desire. You're at a point in your desire where it's, you're okay maintaining the status quo. As long as optically the status quo looks good, then you're, you feel content in your desire and where you're, you're growing at. But desire is at the, the foundation for us all. Do you want to grow in this season? If so, then you make a plan. Then you take steps. Then you invite other people in. But other people can't change your desire. They might want to. And maybe there's some of you all right now that are hoping to change the desire of somebody else. The best way to do that is um, by you not trying to, but by you praying for them and asking God to change his desire. Because when our hearts are so hardened in such a way that we struggle to see the need for growth, it's not us nagging each other that's going to lead to that growth. That's not saying that you shouldn't talk to people and encourage them to grow. But it's not you having that conversation that's going to lead to the growth in their life. It might be you having a conversation, but God gripping their heart and helping them to understand through conviction that they need to grow and need to take steps. Friends, desire is central. So my question for you this morning is, do you even care? If you do care, what steps are you willing to take? What questions are you willing to be asked of you so that you can grow, even though it might feel a natural second? Submission is inevitable for growth. You have to trust Jesus, that he has something good for you even when you don't see it. Even if you don't think that glory is on the other side, even in the hard moments when you're trying to be faithful in what you're doing and you're needing to develop and to grow, you feel the pains of it, when you're rejecting the passivity so that you can grow, you're trusting him in submission that all right, Lord, you have something better for me. I might not see it all right now, but you are growing me. Yes, I feel the growing pains, but this is a part of the process. Friends, yes, it takes desire, but you have to do something with that which you're confronted with, and I want to encourage you this morning with it. Third observation that I want to see us have to grow in this vision of sanctification is that Commitment is necessary for extended growth. Commitment is necessary for extended growth. It's something to desire it for a few moments to even walk away from this sermon and think, okay, this week I genuinely want to desire to do this. And then you're like, this week I'm submitting to Jesus in these different areas. But what happens two weeks, three weeks from now? Are you actually committed to the task? Or are you just going to fall back into that which you know so well? Yeah, I was going to take these steps this week, you know. I was going to get up early and read the Bible and try to grow or, you know, show up and commit to the space to grow in with other believers. You do it for two weeks and then that third week, you're like, man, but the game's on. I had a long day at work. I didn't get enough sleep last night. I don't need to get up. I was going to pray, but life just got so busy that family life was uh, hectic. And we begin to put all these obstacles, roadblocks in our way and allow that to be the reason. Maybe even within that, you start making excuses about those who are around you and how they're growing around you. You even begin to say, well, I'm not growing because I'm not being fed by others. They're not encouraging to me. So many of us make up all of these reasons for, the, for not growing. But 
this verse begins with us. Jesus has extended much to us in his grace, his mercy, and his kindness. And he is faithful in growing you. But it first takes desire, submission, and commitment to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Third this morning, righteousness warrants a life of fruit worth celebration. Looking at verses 20 through 23 with me. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at the time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death, but now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. When you were slaves of sin, you had a standard. You had your own standard. Being in sin allowed you to create your own standard of unrighteousness or what you call righteousness. You have your own decision-making way. But then you look back in your life and you're thinking, what is the fruit of this? What did I gain from this? And you begin to look and it's like, this fruit is actually not fruit fruit at all. That which you are most proud of, you can become ashamed of. That's an odd idea, right? In a season of life that you were so proud of what you were doing, you thought you were, the, you were the man or the woman on top of the world at that point. You let people have it. You let them um, hear what you believed. You did whatever you wanted to do, not mattering how it impacted other people. And you took so much pride in that. But then you look back on that life today, and you're like, man, I actually was a jerk. I was a nice person. Like, I actually wanted people to have a demise, destruction in certain ways. They're going to get what's coming to them. Like, those ideas, those thoughts, you, you share those, you think about those things because you were living for yourself. It's not actually good fruit. You bore something, but it wasn't good. There's, there's a point where you become so infatuated with the good news of Jesus that you look back at your life and you say, I was actually bringing about a life of death, destruction. And here's the reality of it, and this is not to hold us hostage to it, but other people feel the weight of that life. This is why it's so important that if you are enamored by God and you want to follow after him, that you seek to honor him through your instruments in this life. You might have grown from it. He maybe has been making you new. There might be some people from back in the day that still feel the weight of your words. And that defined them. See, many times we don't think about our lives as causing ruin in that type of way for other people. And solidifying that, and we tend to praise that which we used to do. And this is why even in your your process of growth and sanctification, you need to call out the wickedness that you created, the unhealthy habits that you built, how you mistreated others, how you brought them into relationships and situations that weren't for their good, but that was for maybe your good. How you try to manipulate others for your gain. We acknowledge that in Christ because of him being the victor, that we're not bound to that mindset anymore, but we've been freed in Christ so that we can grow. Part of your sanctification is you wholly surrendering yourself in righteousness in every area. That means being forthright in dealing with that which is unrighteous in your life or even within your past. Because it was your own standard that bore you fruit which brought you shame. Jesus did not bring that about in your life. Bad fruit produces death, but good fruit produces life. I pray that in Christ that people see the change that's happening within you as you commit to this process of sanctification, that they see the good fruit, that they see the growth. It should challenge us. It should have an impact in the spaces that we are in. And if it doesn't, we should really look within ourselves and say, Lord, am I producing the same type of fruit? And if I am, then what's going on? Maybe your lack of deep relationships in the gospel is because of what you're producing. Maybe you're identifying that, hey, you're in Christ, but the 
the depths of relationships you're building with other people still seem estranged from that which Jesus is supposedly doing within you. Maybe you're producing something that you don't realize. Maybe they're not the problem. Maybe it's you. He wants you to experience that which brings this life. And that's worth celebrating, friends. Because freedom from sin allows you to receive steward and celebrate the road of sanctification. First, receive it. You have to receive this as a part of your life that you are going to identify with, that you are being sanctified in Christ. That in Christ you have been justified, but he's still growing you. That identification alone will change your life. Because you will begin owning the ways in which you are growing. Not for what you've done, but that you're still in need of God to do a work. That changes the way that you talk to those in your family. Changes the way that you relate to people that you care about. Those whom you work with. Like in our culture today, people acknowledging issues and sin is not too common. Because you feel like you're losing capital in those moments. But when you steward this road of sanctification, um, sorry, when you receive it, you're, you're acknowledging it for yourself as being true in your life, but then you have to steward it. Stewarding it is living it out. I'm a sinner in need of grace, and Jesus is doing a new work in me. I pray that you would bear with me in that. I need help in this. You actually acknowledge sin by name. You don't just go to sleep after you've done something hectic in your family, or you don't just leave work, uh, they'll forget about it tomorrow. That's not the road, the pathway that Jesus is calling you to in sanctification. That might work by other people's standards, but that's not the standard that Jesus is wanting us to go down. Next, we got to celebrate it. To celebrate it is to walk alongside other believers and to say that thanks be to God that they are growing. If you've seen growth in the life of someone that you are walking alongside of, you should tell them that you're seeing growth. You should praise God with them. Tell them, I've seen you grow in patience in so many different ways, and it's so encouraging to me. And the, the ways in which you used to navigate this space, I used to be able to see the look on your face, how it was impacting you, how it was hurting you. I, I see you taking steps forward. Because that, that encouragement is going to help them to stay on the road, to stay on the path. Because it's hard. It's hard to grow. It's hard to take those steps. And that might be that encouragement that helps them to keep pressing in. Because they might be tempted to give in to that which is feeling overwhelming. And that's not just to give someone some notice. But do it out of a general care for them. Because if you're going to be there to remind them of the gospel, even when they're sinning, you need to be there with them to celebrate the victory as well as they're growing and becoming more like Jesus. To both and for us as followers of him. Friends, as we're considering what we are a servant of, is it righteousness or unrighteousness? I think we all have time to pause and reflect. Some of us have maybe had clouded vision lately. Maybe it's just been certain areas of our life. I think we all should think and consider what the path of sanctification looks like for us in our lives. Is it a life that's given over that's going to lead to death? Or do we understand that the free gift that Jesus gives us in his grace actually brings life eternally, but life in abundance? And that life and abundance that he gives you starts now in the life that you live by applying the good news of Jesus to every area of life. Pray with me. Father, we're so just blessed by you that we stand here as recipients of your grace, knowing that we've done nothing to deserve it but that you and your kindness walks with us even in the temptations of this world. 
Father, we thank you for all the growth that has happened in this room. Father, even as I think about it as a pastor, um, how people have grown since the time that they've, I've known them, Lord, and how you and your gospel has gripped their hearts, I pray that they would be so encouraged by that, that they would keep walking with you in that commitment. I pray that we wouldn't become stale in our growth, content with it. I pray that our standard isn't just those who are not following after you and letting them be the low bar. But I pray that Jesus is the standard and that through your spirit and your spirit's work alone, are we going to be able to conform in his, to his image in that way? We know that this takes sacrifice, hard work, commitment. So we ask for your help to strengthen us in this, to endure us in this process. For some, we might look at this and say, I have a long life ahead of me, so you're telling me that there's a, a long life of growth and development, and they might feel discouragement in that, but I pray that they would be encouraged because you have more for them than what they've experienced today in their life. For those who have seen your growth and your development in their lives, maybe in a later season of life, I pray that they wouldn't become content by that which you've already done. But until they return with you and the new heavens and new earth, Lord, I pray that they would just desire to look more like Jesus here. I pray that it would be so clear for us as a church that what we've given ourselves to that even those who aren't walking with you know that there's something different about us. A different standard, a different ethic, a different faith because it's in you. And I pray that that would be an encouragement that ravages through the city and this community about the good news of Jesus and who he is because we get to testify about the greatness of our God. So we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.